Thank you. Are you going to introduce them? Yes. I can, yeah. <laughs> Should we do that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have a most of that, um, that extension? Yes. So you going to be the patient here? Oh. <laughs> I don't have shorts on. Maybe. Oh, you just put your trousers down. <coughs> Which way do you want me? No, no. And facing you. Yes, facing me. <laughs> okay. Okay. Good. Put your trousers down just a little bit more. Okay. Now, to obtain the position, of course what we're going to do is to very gently palpate whereabouts the <coughs> lesion will be. Now whether you're doing it from above downwards or from below upwards, I think it's a matter of personal preference. I normally do it from below upwards. Okay, now I've already made my mind up as to whether I'm going to use the upper or the lower lever. In this particular instance, let us use the um, upper lever just to get the feel of using extension and flexion levers from above and then we can go into using the much shorter lever from below. All right. So I'm going to leave this lower one into just a neutral but we'll say that it is the side flexion towards the left position that I'm in. I'm going to use two pillows and I'm going to put them under the shoulder and this will simulate the side of the table being lifted up, okay? So it's not going to be as efficient as if I'm lifting the table, but it's the best that we can do at the moment. To maintain this in the extension position of the thoracic spine, I'm going to make sure that I pull upwards like this as I produce the right rotation, and she will automatically go into extension. So we've got this in extension with right rotation, which means that she has left rotated with the right side flexion, which means it's stable for right rotation for that particular motion there. Now this is usually a very efficient lever to use if we're using a long lever, so that I have produced right rotation and now I'm going to fine-tune this with this lever now down to the joint that I want to mobilize which I've got it there now and then I'm going to move through a very short part of this lever through the rib cage if I can rather than pushing through all of this so I'm going to come through the rib cage here and just take this back into the rotating position like this and this is a very firm lever for me to use here. As you can see it's not flopping around, the non-congruent position has made it firm but the extension component that I've got this in is much firmer than if I were using the flexion component. Okay? Now then, what I want you to do just as an exercise is to follow down the right hand side of the board. Not worry too much about this lower one. Just sort of place this in our sort of classical position to get the uh, movement up to the joint in question and then just leave that. We won't consider this very much. I just want you to get the feel of the upper lever. Now then, let's take Lois off here for a minute and place the pillow under her waist and it should be probably about two levels or so or a little more higher than the joint that is in lesion. We don't want it right under that joint, that's often shown, that's wrong. It's got to be above that lesion, so we'll come down a little bit. <coughs> now, to make sure that I produce flexion at this joint now, with right rotation, I pull forward, so she comes in this way and I come down to there. So that is taking this into a left side flexion which will produce a left rotation which means in terms of the normal way that we think of movement which means it's stable now for right rotation but in flexion and now I can come onto this flexion lever and I can feel that essentially this is firm but not quite as firm as the extension lever still perfectly adequate for me to, to, to use 
No problem with it. But the longer the levers, I think the more we should think of using extension levers. But this is a perfectly adequate lever, and I can feel that my movement is taking place very low. Now, when we're using very short levers, like I'm using here over the rib cage, which is a fundamental part of what the Norwegian system has always thought about, even with long levers, you try and get as close to the joint in question, the use of the extension or the flexion is not quite so important. But people that kind of use it through the shoulders, it becomes very much more important that you use flexion or extension. Okay? So the longer the lever, if you're prepared to use these long levers, the extension becomes even more important than the flexion. But using these, then I don't think there's any major problem with either flexion or extension, although I tend to use the extension lever anyway when I'm going through the upper lever, all else being equal. So I can move very, very effectively like that. So if you could just try for this start by just pulling into the extension lever and then pulling into the flexion lever and just getting a feel of what the lever is like in that position. Now then, what might be good right from the very start though is this. Let's try a little exercise like we did in sitting and see if it makes any difference to us. And what I'd like you to do is this. I'd like us to use the extension lever exclusively. So this is the first exercise here. So we'll put the shoulder and we'll pack it up and if we have to work in three so somebody could kind of even sit on there and you can pull it but I think if we could perhaps share the pillows out a little bit and lift them up it would be a good idea. Let's try the extension lever like this producing a right rotation for, or put, uh, producing a right rotation in extension and just feel that, which I'm saying is the congruent, or non-congruent position. Then let's ask the patient to sit up, put a pillow under the waist, and see if we can feel any difference. I'm not sure we're going to be able to, just using pillows, but it may be. Still use the extension there, and then come into this one and just sort of try through the rib cage and see if there's any difference between using this one which I'm feeling is the congruent lever, or this one, coming here, which I'm feeling is the non-congruent lever. Just see if you can feel any difference between those two. Because that's the only hassle that we're going to have with the difference of opinion in the notes, as to whether it's a congruent or a non-congruent lever. Both, as we see, absorb rotation. So, would you just try that for a start off? and then go and have a look at putting the upper lever in this non-congruent form, as I'm saying, and then putting the flexion lever in its non-congruent form, just so that you get used to just manipulating those words and so on in your heads. Okay? Thanks, Lois. On, on, on the bed here. <laughs> When we build up any of these movements, of course, what we are doing, regardless of the congruency, non-congruency, is that we're always producing the congruent movement. In other words, if I've got side flexion one way, then whichever rotation goes with that will go with that. So, let's take the example of the extension lever. Because we've got this business about, well, if you push it back, are you going back and unlocking everything? The secret is what you do with the side flexion. This is the important thing. So, that in Brian here, if I side flex him to the left-hand side here, and I'm in extension, what we're saying is that he is in right rotation. That's what happens with the couple. Now then, when I do this movement here, which is left rotation, what we've got to sort of think, and I mean this is a thing that several people have brought up, is are we sort of just unwinding this? In other words, if he's in right rotation, has he all this right rotation available now to go into left rotation? The answer is there's no 
left rotation available if I hold the side flexion because the side flexion to the left holds rotation to the right so that when I try and rotate to the left here it's already held rotated right and held rotated right by the side flexion so the first joint that can left rotate is the joint that is in its neutral position. That's what locking is. It's the forcing down to this thing. Now, this is why it's so important to maintain the side flexion. So that if you've got somebody, especially on a pillow, okay, and what you do is you kind of push like this, then what I've done now is I've lost that side flexion and I'm going back now into a congruent movement. So you've got to be careful that you hold the side flexion. Don't let that go because that's what's controlling the rigidity of the rotation. Does that sound a bit too complicated or is that okay? The side flexion is the key. You've got to hold it so that when we came up into this position here, if I could keep the same thing going, which sometimes gets more confusing. Can you say, oh, sorry, sir, yes, you're just going to say, sit up here and just come a little bit up here. Okay, and we come into the extended position like this, and I go into this position here like that, his spine, what we're saying, has rotated that way, to the right. Now then, so long as I hold that side flexion, there's not going to be any left rotation available in this area because it's rotated right and held right by the side flexion. That's the sort of key here, so that when I try and rotate him this way, you can see, it's, <laughs> what's happening is down, down here there's none available, but if I let that go, in a, it's, this is the congruent movement and I've got a little bit of extra rotation available because the lever isn't as firm. So that's what we're kind of saying about this. It's absolutely essential in when you do the mobilizing that you maintain the side flexion because that's the thing that we are using as our variable. The rotation is set. And particularly if we've sort of found somebody who, you know, had an extension rotation problem this way they couldn't go there. The only thing that we can change is what do we do with the side flexion. And so that side flexion has to be held. Otherwise everything goes wrong. Probably it doesn't go wrong because it's only changing it between the congruent and the non-congruent. And if we are very much asking this patient to concentrate on this point here and we're using muscle-based techniques, these are probably going to be very good anyway. You know, and I sometimes worry that we're kind of making more of this than actually is there, particularly when you look at what Dr. Syriax used to do, which was a fairly sort of global rotation, and his patients, you know, used to get better. Are we doing any better than we did years ago? Well, perhaps we are being able to do things to people that perhaps a few years ago we wouldn't have done much to. On the other hand, you know, I have patients that I say, look, there's this and there's this, and we're going to treat it in this particular way because this is what's safe. And perhaps things don't come on too satisfactorily, and they go to a chiropractor. And I perhaps see them a little later. I say, how did you do? Well, I wasn't doing very well with you, so I went to the chiropractor who manipulated me, and I felt a lot better. And I'm thinking to myself, why didn't I do it? And I go back, and I look at my chart, and I think, geez, I considered manipulation to be very, very questionable. And so I didn't do it. But somebody else who hasn't got all this other stuff did it and got away with it. And, you know, you're mad that you didn't do it, but you look at your protocol and you followed your protocol. And on the whole, we get into problems when we go out of the protocol because equally well, I've had people that say, well, I had this really restricted straight leg raising. The pain was right down my, um, or in my back and a little bit into my buttock. And somebody manipulated me. Now it's right down into my foot and my foot is flapping. You know, so it's a lot worse to make it worse than actually not to help anybody, even though we all like to help people. So I think we need to sort of have our protocol sort of well organized here. Okay, so if that is okay, and we can sort of think now a little bit about the two levers here, okay, just to make sure that we're all doing the right thing. If we've got an extension rotation deficit to the left here. This is excellently written up in your notes actually as to the function of levers and localization. It's really been very clearly written. So whether it's Jim or 
or um, Earl, I'm not too sure who did that, but it's just excellently written. And when we come round into the extension, do we use this lever or do I use this lever? It doesn't really matter. You use which lever you want to use. Because if I hold this in extension and then I've got this lower lever, I can either produce a rotation to the right with the lower lever or a rotation to the left with the upper lever, the relative movement at this joint is going to be an extension rotation left movement because we always describe the description of of course you'd have to describe a description, wouldn't you? We always describe the lesion in terms of the upper bone against the lower bone. So we never talk about the relative movement of the lower bone. And this was a little bit unfortunate in the early days with Jeff Maitland's techniques. He followed a series of abbreviations that were developed by Margaret Jenkinson at the, um, London, at the um, King's College Hospital. And, you know, they were doing rotation to the right like this for all the way down here and then when they came to the pelvis if the pelvis was going to the right they used the same thing but of course the pelvis going to the right is the spine going to the left and so that confused people that try to think regardless of which lever we use we still use the same terminology in the lesioned joint which is what would happen if we move the upper bone how would we describe that? So if we move the lower bone oppositely, we still describe that as a left rotation motion because it's the relative movement. So what to do now is to just think to ourselves, can we just do a double locking here? And let's just do the one where we would alter the side bend in the upper lever and the side bend in the lower lever we'll have to kind of not do this absolutely brilliantly because you'll need two pillows for each group so if we have to work in fours that's fine so if I were thinking of the upper lever here in extension I could put the lower lever into extension or I could put the lower lever into flexion. But we've still got the same rule that if the spine is lordosed, we are going to side bend upwards, the same as we side bent upwards here. And if we've got it in flexion, then we're going to put the pillow underneath the lever so that he side bends towards the bed. So that if this is in extension and that one were in flexion, we could hold them all in flexion or all in extension. But let's do the opposite to each here. So I would have the shoulder raised there to produce a side flexion to the left. And I could take the pillow here and place it underneath there like that. Okay, which side flexes this. This one is the lesion joint and that is neutral at the moment. Now then, I'll set it up in this way of extending with the upper lever and with the lower lever to encourage the flexion of this. Then I'm going to keep the top leg straight and the bottom leg bent and let that drop down here like that, which is giving me a little bit of more of a flexion possibility in this area here. And then I could come into here and instead of using the upper lever, I could use the bottom lever like this. Now the upper lever's in extension, and I've let that extension rotation go into the joint in question, and then I can produce a rotation. Now, if I flex too much, I suppose I'm going into a flexion like this, but I don't. I'm just going to keep the rotation going like that. And that will give me the possibilities of still having an extension rotation in this joint. And I can feel what's going on here. I could move that, move this, come into here and ask the patient, just resist me. Let it go. Resist me. So this would be the post-isometric relaxation technique. Or I could say to the patient, can you try, this is much more difficult, and we're going to use the agonistic correcting technique at the moment okay so can you just resist me so I'm pushing back here which means he's pushing forward there and I'm pulling forward here which means he's pulling back there just hold very easy to do so this is the agonistic muscles that will produce extension rotation to the left working there 
Now relax. Now, can you try and pull? I'll let you win. Pull backwards. There. He knows exactly what to do now so we can convert it to a contract. Relax. Or into an isotonic, agonistic correction now. And he can move into those ways. There. So, just to finish this little section off, can we just try a double lock? This is what's called locking from below and locking from above. And remember that this, how are we talking? We're not talking too much in terms of congruency and non-congruency below. We're simply saying, how, how can I make this lower lever so that it resists rotation to the right? And if it's in flexion, I've got to rotate it to the left. So that means I've got to side flex it to the left, which rotates this to the left, which means it will resist rotation to the right. So that's why I've changed it. Uh, sorry, to the left. So to the left. That was just a deliberate mistake to see if you were on the ball there, Brian, and you met the challenge. Thank you. Okay? So let's just do that, and then we're going to have a break from all this, and we'll talk just about how you use this, and then we're going to go on to something different. So you want the lower lever to prevent so rotation to the left, too? Yes. <laughs> okay. With the lower lever, can I just make one point for you? With the lower lever, if we're going into an increased lordosis, okay, leave the bottom leg straight so that you can use it as a way of getting you into that lever system and then we can kind of raise it up like that if we were choosing to keep the bottom lever in an extended rotated position. If you are going into flexion, bend the bottom leg and leave the top leg straight because that tends to further enhance the rotation whereas the bottom leg straight tends to enhance the extension. So, depending on what you're trying to do with the bottom lever would be determined by whether the bottom leg is straight for extension or bent for flexion. And that sort of helps the whole setup here. Now then, I think that we've probably, we'll come back to this a little bit later on in terms of two other points that I would uh, like to make uh, with it. But just in terms of, let's think of hypermobility and hypomobility, it's pretty obvious, isn't it, that when we're talking about manual therapy principles, we have this principle that we should always hold one level steady and mobilize with the other. So we fix with one and we mobilize with the other. But we all know that just occasionally we're thinking hard and we're working and what might happen is we start doing a bit with both like this. So, if we have an extension lever, all right, an extension lever is very efficient in terms of this top lever, very efficient, because I'm right in front of it and, and I can push back through it. So, if I've got a hypermobile joint in the upper lever, let's say my L2 was hypermobile, and I wanted to involve this in the lock, but I didn't want to actually involve it in the lever, I could use extension or I could use flexion. Wouldn't make any difference in terms of efficiency and so forth. But in terms of not wanting to use it in the lever, I'd probably, because I know occasionally this happens, I'd probably place it in the flexion lever non-congruent because if I come into this position and it's in flexion like this, it's much, much more difficult to actually involve this and, and to, to do this when it's in flexion than when it's right up in front of me and I can just start to rock my body and start using this upper lever. So if I got a hypermobile joint and it was in the cephalic section, I'd use non-congruent locking but I would probably put it into flexion because it tends to reduce my tendency to use the upper lever at all, 
by mistake or inadvertently. <clears throat> it doesn't matter what direction. If, if whatever is a hypermobile in reflection, then you do it in direction. I would probably just think that the best way in terms of hypermobility to start with is just to get a maximum opening of the facet. And a maximum opening of the facet is a rotational technique. And so I'd probably do that rotational technique without worrying too much about flexion and extension. But I could certainly bother a little bit about the lower lever. Do I do it into extension or do I do it into flexion? If you really wanted to sort of um, bring two factors in. Yeah. But either way, you wouldn't use the upper lever as your... You wouldn't use I wouldn't use the upper lever anyway, at, at all. You're just saying to, in case you screwed up a little bit, you wouldn't want to yeah. make it a yeah. vulnerable joint. Yeah. And I think this is a, you know, a reasonable thing that we try to build in safety for our bad days that even then, Everything still works well, because occasionally we do have these bad days, don't we? Very well. Let's have a short break, because it's 10 o'clock. Okay, have a coffee, and then we'll start on some considerations with the sacroiliac joint. We'll get away from the lumbar spine, and I'm going to try with the sacroiliac joint to bring in a few muscle energy principles. Now, how many people are really familiar with totally muscle energy as a sort of subject? Not all of you. So we've got two extra instructors. <laughs> That's good. Tim and Kent here. Okay. So we'll try and involve that. And then We're into now a group test. <laughs> this is like a whole group, so you don't have to worry. You're not going to be quarter responsible for this. <laughs> all right. <laughs> so... We're going to go away a little bit from the sacroiliac joint and we're going to look at this from two aspects. We'll look, to, look at it partially from the manual therapy aspect and partially from the muscle energy aspect. Then we'll come back at some stage just to finish off the lumbar spine muscle energy in terms of the ERS, FRS, NSR kinds of lesions. All right? So, I want to get away from the lumbar spine, though, for the time being. You've, you've done enough on that, and you'll be getting sick of it. Okay? So, I'm going to ask a number of questions. To do this, whether it's the manipulation course or whether this, the same questions, because I think we need to keep going back and asking ourselves, what do I know about this particular area? What are the key things? Well, this is what I consider to be a good starting point for us now in terms of your knowledge of the sacroiliac joint and these are the questions I'd like to, you to ask yourselves first of all what produces movement so I needn't write down in the sacroiliac joints but what produces movement Secondly, what do you know about the joint surfaces? Third question, could you name and give the function of, not name the function, but name and function of the intrinsic and I